Song of Solomon. How many of you read that for your daily devotions? <clears throat> it's called the Song of Songs, written by Solomon, King Solomon. We're not doing a strict verse-by-verse -verse interpretation like we would do with something like, say, uh, 2 Samuel or some of those. They read like a story, right? Song of Solomon does not read like a story. After all, it's a song, and it has many repetitions. But a very special message in song is in the Song of Solomon, and we want to explore that. I'm going to do this in three parts. Today will be the part one. When the song is read with Christian glasses on, it blossoms out beautifully and wonderfully. Notice what Jesus said about the songs of the Old Testament. If you have a Bible with you, I would like to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, 44 and 45. Luke 24, 44 and 45. I see a lot of Bibles here this morning. I hear the leaves turning. Verses 44 and 45. After the resurrection, Jesus met with the disciples in the upper room. And notice what he said to them. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the psalm, psalms, which means songs. These were the songs that the Old Testament church sang concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So these uh, songs in the Old Testament are messianic, and they're very, very important to us, to our understanding of the Christ event. We need to see the Old Testament as a glorious prophecy, a promise of Messiah to come, the Redeemer King. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of that promise. Solomon's song is a love song. But a love relation, and it's about a love relationship between two people. In interpretation, it's really the beautiful story of the Christian's relationship to Jesus. The Bible message taken into our lives causes us to turn our hearts often away from self to Him who is the great heavenly lover. The Song of Solomon is a tantalizing story because. There is a plot in this story. But you have to look for it. You have to dig for it. It's one of those places you have to dig for it. The story is never quite as explicit as you'd like it to be. But it's there. So let's consider an inspired love story, remembering that it has some deep implications that involve us as well. Scene number one. Picture with me in your mind this scene. You know, the human mind has a huge capacity to imagine things. You remember in the, in the Genesis story, in, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 6, it talks about the imaginations of the heart being only evil continually? Wow, huge. But the imagination is also for good things, right? And as we Im imagine these scenes, scene by scene, it makes great, great sense to us. The scene is in a vineyard with a rock wall around it. There is a lone young woman in the vineyard, and she stooped down day by day, day after day, working in the vineyard, pruning the branches, pulling the weeds, uh, working the ground, training the vines, and whatever else that they do in a vineyard. That's what she's doing in the hot sun every day. Her skin is dark and brown, and, and blotchy, perhaps. She feels very self-conscious about herself. Notice Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 6. Song of Solomon is right after Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon. Solomon wrote the Proverbs and the Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 1, verse 6. And here's what it says. <clears throat> Look not upon me because I am black, 
because the sun has looked down on me. My children's children are angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. She's a very sorrowful woman, and she's feeling really sorry for herself here. She says, don't look at me. Why? Because I'm black from the sunshine every day, and blotches perhaps on my skin. And besides that, my family is displeased with me. She's sort of an outcast within her own family. Perhaps she's a bit undisciplined and very discouraged. She views herself as one who has not kept her own vineyard. She is shy because she thinks her skin color is extreme and blotches and sun-worn skin. And she's hurt because of family rejection. Get the picture. Imagine with that little scene. As she's working away there, day after day, perhaps one day close to the stone fence that surrounds the vineyard, a shepherd boy appears outside the vineyard, outside the rock wall, and he's tending a little small band of sheep. And he comes over closer to the fence, and soon a conversation develops between a young woman working in the vineyard and the shepherd boy tending his sheep. And day after day, that shepherd comes back, and a friendship develops, a conversation before, between them. Finally, the young woman is always looking forward to the shepherd boy showing up in the morning with the sheep for the daily visits. She knows the man is awakening within her the emotion of what? Say it. Love. Okay. It's love. It's a love story. She knows deep in her heart that she wants to be his, his and his alone forever. She knows, she, she knows she'd like to be outside the vineyard. Her heart is beginning to fill with hope. And then one day, what happens? Maybe you guessed it. He doesn't show up with the sheep. What a letdown. He doesn't come back the next day, nor the next day. And here's this young woman who's beaten down with her situation, rejected by her family. Life situation is already is hard. And then the hope and love comes into her life and now desolation, worse off than she was before. She lost the one who had been speaking to her. And what do you do when all seems lost and cold? What do you do? The Bible says, ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall what? Search with, for me with all of your heart. She picks up her courage. She leaves the vineyard to look for the shepherd. And what she doesn't know is that the shepherd boy with whom she had been speaking and visiting with and learning to love was none other than the young King Solomon himself. We don't know why the young king would be out there tending sheep. Perhaps he was uh, worried that people would accept him because of the position he held and the wealth that he had. For after all, notice who he was, son of David and the king of Israel. And she disguised her, and she, and he disguised himself as a shepherd herding his sheep. But this much is certain. The shepherd was the king. So she leaves the vineyard, and yet she doesn't know who he is. She goes down to the little tents near the foot of the hill where the shepherds are. And she asks them, can you tell me where the shepherd is that had the little band of sheep up there by the vineyard? And uh, well, the shepherds, they've been cued. They're in on it. They say, why don't you go down to such and such a place and sort of hang out down there? And can you imagine? And wonder of wonders, this young woman's surprised when she discovers that the shepherd boy is the king of Israel. What a discovery. A lowly maiden. Just a farm girl who works in the hot sun all day, finds herself in love with the king, and not only that, but loved by the king. 
You see anything here in the, in, the, in the Christian life that compares to this in any way? Oh, that is a discovery that every Christian makes. The astounding discovery that she is loved by the King of Heaven, the Son of David, right? Of all the people in the world or the universe, who would you choose? Of all the people, they're in the, in the, maybe even the beings in the universe, of all, who would you choose to make a friendship with? Would it be, a, would it be your greatest privilege if you were to meet the governor of Arizona and become on a first one-to-one -one basis with him? And maybe his lovely wife. And you could talk to them anytime you wanted to. Would you like to have a close friendship uh, with... Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you was on a one-to-one -one basis with the President of the United States? He has his cell phone. He talks to you. You can call him any time. He knows you by your first name, and perhaps you're on a first-name basis with him. You could call him, and he'd answer on his own personal cell phone. Like that? And the President would talk to you, and he would call you by your first name. I can't imagine what that would be like. Revelation 3.20 says, what does it say? Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. What a God who comes to this dark world, disguises himself as a shepherd, and uh, in the garb of humanity, lowly humanity. When, when Jesus came and left the course of heaven, he went lower and lower until there was not a lower place for him to go. Born in a donkey's food box. Now, that's no slur on a donkey. Donkeys are very wonderful creatures. In fact, I think that the noblest creatures that God made, besides man. And he wants to talk to me. He wants to talk with me. And fellowship with me. John 14, 15 says he wants to be our friends. Can't imagine that kind of a privilege. Can you imagine the privilege of knowing and being known by the Creator, the King of the universe? Would that be some privilege? Kind of imagine that. Can you is your is your imagination wide enough and spread far enough that you could comprehend such a thing? He knows your name. He knows where you live. He knows who you are. He watched you get out of bed this morning. The very head, the hairs on your head are numbered. And when you woke up this morning, he knew all about it. He doesn't just know all this about you, but he knows you. And much more, he knows all about you, and yet he still loves you. And he's interested in you, and he knows me. And that's a great discovery. The king loves me. The little farm girl must have blushed almost to death as she, as, she, as she realized what had happened here. I looked so bad when he saw me in my affliction. What could he have, what could he have seen in me? My skin is darkened and blotched by the sun. And when he whole held my hand over the rock wall, remember? When he held my hand, my hands were calloused and hard from the work. Sometimes I shake hands with somebody, and I realize these are hands of somebody that really works. Have you ever noticed that? Have you done that? You had that all experience? Okay. But in reality, he loved her. And he knew, and, and, he, and he knew she loved him, not because of who he was or how rich he was, because of, but because of what he was, a wise shepherd boy with a sterling character, a wise shepherd boy. My, oh, my. So we love God, not because of what he can do for us, but what he is. We love him because of his person, his character, his goodness. We love him for the character he has. God is so good. Has he been good to you already this morning? 
When I got up this morning, I had breath. Yes, he is. The big temptation that we have is to love him because of what he can give us. Maybe the loaves and the fishes, right? People followed him around for the loaves and fishes. Sometimes our prayers might reflect a little bit of that. You know what happens? That spoils the relationship. That spoils the relationship. The Bible says that when Jesus came, there was no form of comeliness that we, that we would desire him. Early on, <clears throat> notice what happened to Abraham. Maybe perhaps he loved God because of God's leading in his life and the things he got from God. Early on, that, that could be, couldn't it? God gave him Isaac, for example. What a precious, obedient son. In his impossible old age, God gave him a son. And he would willingly obey his father. Why? Because he loved his father. And love begets faith. And when you love, you trust. So God looked at, down at Abraham and thought, what would Abraham do if I took his son away, his only son? What would Abraham do? Would he still love me? <laughs> God says to Abraham, take, you, take now your son, your only son, sacrifice him on a mountain that I will show you and Abraham was faced with a choice. Would he love God for what he is or only for the good things that God gives him? What a test that was. We all know at the end of that story, God must have thought at the end of that story, God must have thought, wow, Abraham thinks like we think. Can you picture God thinking that way? Abraham thinks like we do. He's willing to give up his son. The Bible says that Abraham was a friend of God, and friends love each other. And that's how Abraham was. Romans 13 says that love is the fulfilling of the what? The law. And John, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. We're talking about a love relationship here. And love begets love. God is faithful and obedient to his promises. In Hebrews 5.8, it talks about being obedient. He learned obedience from the things that he suffered, it says. God learning to be obedient? What's that all about? Think of it. God is obedient. What is he obedient to? Well, for starters, he made some great promises to us, right? And he kept those promises to the T. The law is a transcript of his character. It's what he's like. Rick, he would never lie to you. He's a God of truth. Goodness. And love is faithful. And he is infinitely obedient to all the promises that he's made to us. That's the character of God. That's what he is. We have a song we sing. That's why I love him. That's why I love him. Because he first loved me. And when I'm tempted and tried, he is close by my side. That's why I love him so. Do we mean that when we sing that song? What an idea. So Solomon is loved for what he is, kind and tender and wise. And <coughs> what do you think went through her mind when he said, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Will I marry? And she accepts. And what a conscient, conscious decision we all make with God every day. A conscious decision. And she made that decision. Revelation 19, 7 to 9. We won't take the time to turn there, but it says the bride has made herself ready. I think that's a reference back to Song of Solomon. We are no longer in the field. We were with the king, with the king forever. Do you know the Bible even says in Ephesians 2, verse 6, that we dwell with him in heavenly places. And the tense there is present. Have you been with him today in heavenly places? We dwell with him there by faith. So we have seen the excitement of a love story 
the excitement of a farm girl's discovery that she is loved by the king. Now the next scene. The curtain comes down. Then it goes up again. A new backdrop. New props in place. And I'd like to have you turn with me to Song of Solomon chapter 2. Song of Solomon chapter 2. A new scene. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Are you still there? Do you all have it? It says, <clears throat> As the apple tree among the... As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among, among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. New scene now, right? <laughs> Wedding takes place. The king's banqueting hall, the great room loaded with food, marble urns and flowers and silverware all over the place. People are scurrying to and fro to make it so special. It's a wedding. It's her wedding to the king. Can you imagine how this young, lowly farm girl felt in the surroundings? Have you ever been at a formal banquet where you had more things to eat with, utensils to eat with, than you ever would use, right? Have you ever been there? Yeah, some of us have been to that kind of a banquet. Everything is laid out. Ten times the number of things you need to eat with. Servants all over the place carrying the food, and, and everybody's busy. And you look around not knowing quite where to begin. And this is all for you. It's not for another person. Hebrews 9.24 says that what Jesus did for us, he did for us. For us is used in that expression. It's for us. How could we not leave this place without saying, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What have you done? What have you wrought for me? So here's this young woman from the vineyard in the king's banquet hall, and she looks around, and there she sees the big banner hanging from the ceiling. It has on it the emblem of the king, and his insignia are on that. His banner, his banner over me is love. And she looks at the royal family banner. Remember, who is Solomon? He's the son of who? David, son of David. Does that make it ring any bells? Jesus is the son of David. Going to sit on, on David's throne one day, right? When the priestly ministry is finished. The Bible flows. Jesus is the son of David. He's the one who is filled with all wisdom and knowledge. And 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 30, talk about that. 24 and verse 30, talk about that. How that he's all wisdom. He is the, the embodiment of the wisdom of God. Jesus is. And she realizes now that she's the part of what? A royal family, a new family. She's under the royal banner. He's at her left hand. She's accepted now. Again, part of the royal family. None dare reject her now. It's like Romans 8, your scripture reading this morning. In spite of what she is in herself, she's been rescued from the vineyard. And she's now viewed as a princess, as royalty, as the queen. She says, he brought me to the banqueting table. And his banner over me is love. Do you understand what that means? When we become a part of the family of God? When we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord? It means so much more this morning. More, it, it means so much more than moving from this house to that house. To a better house. Even the mansions of the Father's house. That's only the icing on the cake. When we all get to heaven, we're going to go to the Father's house, right? And in that Father's house are many rooms. But it's much more than that. That's just the icing on the cake. The most exciting thing that can happen to a man or woman or boy or girl is to become a Christian and fulfill that commitment. 
perhaps an illustration from my own family. My grandfather, two of my grandfathers, both grandfathers on both sides. My grandfather was a German peasant boy in southern Russia. It was a hard life in that land where they were not welcome. Catherine the Great had, had invited Germans, poor Germans, to come to Russia and kind of settle the place a little bit because it was a wild place. There were aboriginals there and they were, they were uh, needed to be brought a little bit under more civilization. So they were welcome, the welcome language, uh, welcome mat was put out. But when they got there, they found out that they didn't speak the language. Everything was different. Aboriginal people burned their haystacks, left their gates open so the cattle would, would get loose and roam free, and uh, stole their horses, tore down their fences. They didn't want them there. They don't want the fences. They have all the land to roam on. Now, that's the same thing happened in this country, right? Can you imagine with me what this was like? And um, they were upset with this. And then wonder of wonders, a little window opened. And my two grandfathers had the privilege of leaving and immigrating to America. When grandfather came to America, he didn't just make a move from one country to another one. He was faced with a choice, and that choice was whether or not the history of America would become his history. He's not just changing countries, but he's becoming now an American. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are not historical grandfathers. They're not the historical forefathers of mine by birth. I want to say that again. Abraham Lincoln and George Washington are not historical for forefathers of mine by birth. They're not mine by birth, right? Grandfather had no Lincoln blood in him, and when Lincoln was president, my grandfather was a Russian. But when he came to America, and he read these words, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty. And dedicated to the proposition that all men are born what? Equal. Then he said, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether, that, whether or not this nation can long endure. Grandfather read these things. And as he read these words, my grandfather, two of them, chose Abraham Lincoln to be their forefather. We can do that, can't we? <laughs> We don't need to be separated from the continent of heaven because Jesus is the new Adam, the second Adam, a, a new line. We have a new, no, new father of the race now. A new race has been formed, a new family line. And what we can do is, is choose to be born into that family. And although he never physically descended from American stock, he became an American. Choosing the history and ideals of America to be his history, his history and ideals. Truthfully, he could now say, I am a what? An American. Now, when Lincoln was alive, there was a civil war, right? My grandfather was in Russia. But now he could say, truthfully say, I'm an, I'm an American. Abraham Lincoln's history is my history now. The Christian makes a similar choice. And here's what we choose. We choose the new history that Jesus wrought out on this world in our organism for 33 years. What kind of a history is that? It was perfect in every respect. He learned, by, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What a history that was. Every day, a cup of cold water to somebody, an unselfish act to people. 
And what we do is we choose for the history of Jesus Christ to be our history. That's why the Bible calls him the last Adam, a new family, a whole new race of people. We can be born into that. We have to choose that, though, right? Grandfather had to choose that to make that kind of a decision. In spite of my past, in spite of my sin and failure, the Bible tells me I can choose the history of Jesus to be my history. And we have that in justification. Just as if we had never sinned. We need not worry about what the Father thinks about us, but what he thinks about Christ, my substitute. A whole new picture before us. Do you understand that language? He's the creator God. He's the God man. Oh, how he loves you and me. And when I do that, my own failures are no longer mine. He takes them. The dark skin from being in the sun too much, the laziness, the disorganized mind that I've had. His successes are now my successes. This is what it means to be adopted into the family of God and to be covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It means that God will see that Christ's history will be our own history. And a new name. In Jeremiah 23, verse 6, it says, Our new name is the Lord our what? The Lord our righteousness. That's the banner over us. That's the banner of love. Isn't it a marvelous privilege? So she's sitting at the banqueting table, very much a farm girl, but treated like what? Like a queen. Do you know the promise to Laodicea in verse 21 of chapter 3 of Revelation? It says that we will be accorded the privilege of sitting with Christ in his throne, even as he is seated with Christ in his throne. I have no idea what that means, but I believe it. He took me to his banqueting table. And this banner over me is love. The royal family banner becomes her covering. How is your imagination? Can you imagine? Can you begin to imagine what this all means? Let's take a look at a Bible text. And we're going to be done here in just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2. These are my favorite verses in all the book. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. <clears throat> Jim, it talks about grace here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. If you could begin to imagine this. But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, was quickened us together with Christ. By grace you were saved. And has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What is the tense in this verse? <laughs> Present tense, right? Have you been there this morning? <laughs> Throughout this day, it's our privilege every day by faith. Verse 7. That in ages to come we might, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindnesses toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. What a privilege that all is. Do you want victory over sin in your life? Here's the only way. He changes us when we go our hearts to him. The Holy Spirit now comes into our lives and begins to make us new people, new creatures in Christ. And this is an ongoing thing every day, and we call it the process of sanctification. How about the bad habits, the unhappy thoughts? Perhaps even anger issues. He took me to the banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. Yes, 
And a real friend is one who knows all about me and still loves me. If you feel downtrodden and feel like you've had some bad raps in, in your life, don't let, that har let, don't let that harm you any further. Justification here. He sees me as though as I can, as that, he sees me as I can be in his grace. But he doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in a broken way. Sunburn, blotchy skin, rough hands. But sanctification and more and more like Jesus every day. He's going to take people to heaven. He's promised that. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. You know, this is so much greater than the little, the little girl in the vineyard. Romans 3, 23 says, and 24 says, justified freely by his grace. That little word freely is a curious word. It means without cause. He justifies me without cause in my own life other than that I just give myself to him, without cause. Justified freely, without cause. She belongs to the king. On what basis now is she the queen? The only basis she has is his banner over me is love. You can't explain any of this without the expression love. The curtain closes. The next scene in this inspirable parable comes alive. We have only one life to live. Not always on easy street. Song of Solomon tells it like it is. What happens when trouble comes? And it does. The next time I'm up here, we're going to talk about scene chapter 3. What happens when trouble comes? Is there a provision for it? How about you? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Perhaps there's someone here today who has never tasted of the water of life, which is poured out so freely for us. Maybe we've never seen the tree of life. You know, in the little book, Healthful Living by Ellen G. White, it says that the pages of the Bible are leaves from the tree of life. Leaves from the tree of life. Do we have access to that? And it's for, the, for our healing. Maybe one here has never felt the joy and peace that can only come from a, from a reasonable encounter, a meaningful encounter with Jesus Christ, the son of David, no less. Maybe someone here has fallen away and have, not, and have been drinking from a broken cistern where the water keeps leaking out. This morning again, I want to open the doors of this church. This is Christ's body. If there's anybody like that, I want to pray for you this morning. And I want to urge you to give your heart to Jesus. Make that the next thing you do. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. That's what church is for. To restore those broken relationships and to initiate new ones. One of these days, we're going to be on our way to heaven. Talked about that in... Lamont's class this morning. We don't know where we're going to travel to, right, Lamont? The universe will be the, for the exploration of the redeemed. What a love on his part. He's the king of heaven. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love. We can't comprehend it. You brought us to this place this morning, Lord, on your holy day, so that we can bask in the sunshine of your love. I pray that you'll be with each person here, Lord. All of us have different needs, and you know what those needs are. And I pray, Lord, that you will, that you will be able to instill a new birth in us, all of us here, that we'll all be taken to heaven, Lord, when you come. Amen. If there are people in the valley of decision here this morning, Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts in a very special way. We pray, Lord, that you will give all of us a new commitment 
a new love for you, a renewed love for you, so that when you come again, we will be able to look up into the sky and so, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.